So um, I'm going to talk about uh, scaling, but I see it as, uh, as a window onto looking for simplicity and universality across a very broad spectrum um, from uh, the kinds of things we've been talking about earlier, but also uh, moving more into, uh, if I leave myself some time, <laughs> social. Um, I'm going to set the timer. That's what I'm going to try to do. First ever. ever. Yeah, it is. The first ever. So You're I'm going to... setting it to an hour and a half. I've set it... <laughs> I set it for 50 minutes, <laughs> just in case. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> so I'm slightly embarrassed because uh, I wasn't too sure, like everybody else, of course, I wasn't too sure who the audience was. And um, I think many of you who have heard me speak will have seen a lot of this, actually, and some of these slides are probably older than some people in this room, actually. Um, but uh, I'm going to try to give us a sweeping overview of uh, the role of scaling um, and its um, use as a window onto underlying principles and the whole question of universality. Um, and, uh, uh, but in po in, in implicit also in scaling, and very often forgotten, of course, is the whole question of scale itself. Uh, where do these time scales come from, for example, of our lifespans? Why are they so different? Of uh, things like why do we sleep the length of time we do? Other animals sleep much less, others much more. Um, uh, the whole question of um, uh, mortality. Uh, why is it that companies and, human and animals, for example, are destined to die but cities seem to just go on growing. So those are the kinds of questions that are actually also implicit in scaling. And the last one, which I hope I do have a little time to get to, the fundamental question of socioeconomic life, that it seems to get faster. So I cut out, because we had some very interesting discussions and they sort of covered it all, a whole philosophical background uh, I will try to come back to it at the very end, but we had some stuff yesterday I thought that was very interesting. The nature of law, uh, of laws, emergent laws, as distinct from somehow fundamental laws, the fundamental laws of physics, the emergent laws of adaptive systems. And um, maybe we'll come back to that, and I think in the discussion that would be interesting, the, dis the, the group discussion later, that would be very interesting. But uh, so I'm going to state, start out straight away with what I consider the, the most famous law, of course, in, uh, in uh, scaling in, in biological systems, and that is the famous Kleiber's law on metabolic rate. And uh, it's kind of extraordinary because this is a, an adaptive system, and uh, to varying degrees, everything about each one of these organisms is, is historically contingent. Each component of it is historically contingent, and yet all these things have uh, somehow uh, managed to line up on a single line. Um, and this is the most primitive form of a universal behavior because there's obviously, it says, that there's some universal constraint that has constrained the evolutionary process uh, to make all these things line up on one line, especially when you realize that metabolism of itself is probably the most complex process in the universe, for all we know, because it makes life out of stuff. Um, so um, uh, the other thing about this is that it has a slope that is less than one, which means there's an economy of scale. The bigger you are, the less you need per capita. The slope is very close to the number three quarters. Um, and uh, we have this systematic behavior that uh, sort of the average sale, cell is operating at a slower rate systematically. The bigger you are, the most fundamental aspect of a, system, of a system. That is, the system is controlling the fundamental component, which is the complete antithesis to the 
traditional reductionistic idea that if you know the cells, you know the genes, you can build everything up. This says actually the thing itself is controlling the behavior of the constituent. Uh, so um, that's what I've said, but it's also true that these scaling laws pervade all of biology, and I'm just going to flash through some. Here is that same, this is a line that's actually drawn in to be three quarters, but going down to the uh, cellular and molecular level, um, and I'm going to flash through these quickly. Here's something mundane, heart rates decreasing with a slope of minus one quarter, so times are getting longer the bigger you are, rates are getting uh, uh, slower. Um, here's something much more profound, uh, the white to gray matter in the brain, scaling with a slope that's very close to five quarters. Um, here's uh, something with more variance in it, genome length, uh, with a slope uh, very close to one quarter. And uh, this is the last one I'm going to show. This is uh, the radius of tree trunks, uh, the radius of the aorta, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, scaling with a slope of three eighths, which means the cross section goes approximately three quarters, but it's the same as tree trunks. So this is about as universal as you could get that somehow inside us is just like what's outside us in terms of the plants and trees and so on. So um, there is this extraordinary universality uh, expressed by the uh, that first of all, the existence of these about as simple as possible scaling laws you could imagine in the mo most diverse and complex system you could imagine. Um, and um, it, it, cover it also has built into it this curious number one quarter. And uh, the explanation for this that uh, we proposed already many years ago was that um, the the uh, underlying dynamic that is giving rise to this, which, by the way, obviously has to transcend evolved design. It's true in plants and trees and insects and <coughs> mammals and so on. Uh, whatever it is has to transcend that design, and the idea was it was some generic properties, mathematical and physical properties of the multiple networks that support life, so whatever they are, and somehow the same principles are at work, and I'm not going to belabor them, um, but here are the ones. This is work that, uh, where's Brian? Brian was when he was a little boy with, <laughs> with a ponytail. Uh, <laughs> uh, we work with Jim, Jim Brown. And um, I'm not going to belabor these, but there's some obvious things, but they have to be generic, like the network has to be space filling, it has to go everywhere. Every cell has to be supported by the network. Um, uh, but the, the most powerful assumption in all this was an, a kind of optimization or extremal assumption that um, of the infinitude of possibilities of the network design that has some of these other properties, um, that um, the ones that have design have optimized something. And the one I would just flash through briefly is, that, for example, the circulatory system. Um, it has evolved so as to minimize the amount of work the heart has to do to, to pump blood through and supply oxygen to the cells. Or to put it more generally, it is m optimized so that you spend the minimum amount of energy keeping yourself alive so you can maximize the amount of energy you can devote to sex and reproduction and therefore to your Darwinian fitness. So that's why these are in one way or another related, it can be thought of as derivative of putting natural selection into this kind of physics-y framework. So that was the idea, and then you have to put all these into mathematics, and you have to take these networks and use these uh, ideas, and uh, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to show that, I'm just going to show there is mathematics, and it's actually amazingly pretty much the same equations that you've seen from, you saw originally with Bob, so sort of hydrodynamic-like, and so forth, but and the optimization is also as a constrained one, it's not max ent, but it's similar in, in spirit that you have uh, a system that has all these properties, but you put in certain constraints. 
and uh, this is just using classic uh, um, Euler Lagrange or Lagrange multiplier techniques. And when you do all that, you end up with, at the top there, you can derive that, at least asymptotically, the metabolic rate should go as mass to the d over d plus 1, where d is the dimensionality of the world you live in, which has to be 3. So I show this because you can see if put d equals 3, you get the 3 quarters, and you see that 4, the number 4, which is so ubiquitous, is actually not 4, it's actually 3 plus 1, and the 3 comes from the space filling of a three-dimensional space, and the 1 is to do with the to do with the optimization that gets expressed through the fractality and self-similarity of these uh, multiple networks. So what's next here? So you can then derive a million different things about all these various networks, and you, you obviously can't absorb this, um, and, uh, but you can see predicted and observed, and the agreement is remarkably good. And the mystery, well, let me leave it at this for a minute, the mystery about this work to me, anyway, is not that it works, is why in the hell does it work so well, at least at this level, in this coarse-grained way, why, does it, why is it so powerful and predictive? Because it's so simple in principle. Um, and that is probably to do with, side comments, something that ought to be discussed here, and I had to actually had some slides and I took them out, the renormalization group because it's something to do with something is driving this towards a fixed point that is somehow justifying why uh, these are, uh, th this simple theory, this simple model works. Um, this is also for trees and plants, uh, for, and um, I know plants, I know trees are plants, but, uh, uh, <laughs> um, and the important thing is that it's the same, this, that you get all these lovely results even though the engineered design is completely different. A, a tree is not the same as your cardiovascular system. You have a beating heart and so on and so forth. It's a, a tree is a fiber bundle and uh, you're a bunch of pipes joined together in terms of your circulatory system anyway. Yet, but the same principles apply and that's the idea. So let me move on. That's about forest. I'm going to miss that out. But the other thing that comes out of this is that these Network geometry and dynamics controls the pace of life. And um, it leads to what you could call, what I'm using the language of this uh, meeting, a universal time scale because anything that is associated with the network, and therefore by implication associated with metabolism, which of course drives everything, necessarily from this has to scale with a quarter power in terms of its rates. So all these things which are quite different superficially actually in terms of their scaling all scale together in the same way. Okay? So, um, and you have to of course then make models for each of these and I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to do one of them. I think I kept put in here. Yes, oh, I was just going to show you one. I mean, here's the rates of uh, DNA substitution rates, and you can see that uh, here's the slopes. You can see they're predicted to be minus one quarter, and they're all pretty damn good. And one side comment, um, s scaling has become synonymous with power laws, but power laws are just one form of scaling, of course, and indeed, Something I'm not talking about is that this stuff also scales with temperature, and of course there it scales exponentially because of the uh, Boltzmann factor, or the Arrhenius factor, in terms of chemical reaction rates. Um, and that is of course why global warming is so awful, it's because a small change in temperature is, gets exponentially enhanced. Okay. So um, what the, 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 the quantity that always intrigued me, because I was getting old, uh, was uh, death, was lifespan. That lifespan uh, scales approximately as mass of the one quarter. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, 
But as I've written down here, I showed you a moment ago the heart rate, like all these times, decreases the mass of the one quarter. Therefore, you multiply them together. The dependence on mass disappears. So lifetime times heart rate, which is the number of heartbeats in a lifetime, is an approximate invariant. And there it is. And there's the data. So what it says, there's a kind of universality to life in general. That is, if you look through the right lens, even though a blue whale may live 125 years and a shrew a year or so, actually, look through the right lens, they live exactly the same length of time. If you govern it by heartbeats, which is a stupid thing to govern it by, what you should do it by is go deeper down and govern it by the rate at which you produce ATP, the number of ATP molecules. And if you do that, everybody, roughly speaking, stays, uh, 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 lives the same length of time. And what I'm now going to show you is that everybody grows in the same way. And so let me talk briefly about growth as one of these time scales. So how does growth work in this? Well, very trivially, you eat, you metabolize, you send metabolic energy through the networks. The networks feed cells, and at the cellular level, you allocate energy to maintenance. You repair stuff that is damaged. You replace cells that have died with new ones, and then you add new stuff. So I did write down a piece of mathematics here, and I'm not going to belabor this either, but you can write this in the simplest way of writing it. I'm, uh, as I said, I'm not going to belabor it. Just know that you can do it. It's pretty obvious, pretty simple, and you can solve this equation. But here's the point I want to emphasize. The parameters in this equation are universal in this coarse grain way because they are the overall scale of metabolism, the average mass of a cell, the average energy needed to create a cell. And so if you do that and you, there's a solution, first of all, you can see that it fits very well. Here's the, us as rats. Beautiful fit. That happens to be one of the best. But here's more generally. Here's just a couple of mammals, a fish and a bird, and you can see that it's, it's pretty damn good. But most importantly, because there is a universality to the equation and to the parameters that control that equation, you can rescale everything. According, that's what all this hieroglyphics is here, so that there is a single curve and all growth collapses onto it. So everybody grows. Again, if you look through the right lens, everybody grows following the same curves. And of course, the theory tells you the form of that line. Well, um, that's been extended to include not just insects, but also insect communities, beehives and uh, anthills and so on, which are fit on here. And you can see some outliers here, but it's pretty good. And then uh, we extended it to tumors. And that leads to a whole, whole other thing that we could talk about, about the structure, the organization structure, metabolism, growth of, um, of tumors and the question of cancer, which I'm not going to do, but there you can see it. That's some of those gray points of the tumors. Uh, and what you see, by the way, just a side comment, is that, of course, um, two things left to their own, so to speak, if you could survive, tumors do stop with these tumors, the hard tumors stop growing, solid tumors stop growing, and that um, uh, they're just like us. Well, obviously they're like us because they are us, but here it is. Okay. Now, um, I want to switch gears and talk about cities because here we have this whole network theory that you can derive many, many things from, which I'm not <coughs> touching upon. Um, but um, it's very natural to ask about other kinds of network systems that have traditionally been metaphorically compared to organisms like cities or companies, which are often thought of as organisms, as I say, metaphorically in the literature. And um, I want to introduce it by showing this picture, this satellite picture taken in the, uh, by NASA in the year I was born, 1940. And that's what it looked like, okay? Of course, I mean, that's my, 
Thank you, David. <laughs> you got it. I actually, and this was taken just a couple of years ago. So in my pissy little lifetime, the most extraordinary thing has happened in the universe. Nothing like this has probably happened anywhere else in the universe in the 79 years I've been on this planet. Nothing. I mean, the dynamics that has led, I should have had an earlier one, which was 200 years ago, which had been completely black, of course. And you all know what it is. It's socioeconomic activity, and this represents urbanization. And it is incredible. And uh, uh, it, uh, just a side comment, that uh, it is interesting that even though this is, to my mind, the most amazing phenomenon that has happened uh, in the last 100 years, 200 years, um, there's no actual program in any of our federal agencies to examine the science of this explicitly. It's all deconstructed into all its bits and pieces, which is completely antithetical to what this meeting is about. Okay, so, as we know, that phenomenon, I could have also done, by the way, I could have had another picture which projects into the future where the whole thing is a, a, truly aglow, and by the way, you don't have to be a physicist to know that if you've gone from here, whoops, I'm doing a Bob Laughlin here, I don't know what happened. I guess you have to be a certain age to fuck up this, uh, moving these things around. Uh, if you go from here to here, and you know you've done it by burning the detritus of stuff, that system has to heat up. So you don't have to be a physicist to know there has to be what's now called global warming and therefore climate change. Okay. So um, given the threat that this has uh, given us, um, I believe it's very urgent that we do start to think about whether they, we can construct a science of cities. It may be totally inconceivable and therefore understand the whole question of sustainability because the future of the planet is completely bound up with the future of the cities. So we need to understand how they developed, where they're going, and uh, what their organization and structure are, and are there any unified principles. So to use the same paradigm that we, I talked about in the biology, first of all, to city scale. We just saw that, uh, you know, that despite uh, its long neck um, and despite the, the fact the giraffe having a long neck and the elephant a trunk and the whale in the ocean and we walk on two legs and the mouse scurries around, we're actually at the 80, 90 percent level scaled versions of one another in terms of the physiology that we can measure and the uh, life history events that we track. So is that true of cities? Here we are in Washington, D.C. Is it a scaled up Santa Fe or a scaled down New York? Well, you can only answer that uh, by looking at data. But the first thing to recognize about a city is the thing that has been a theme all day yesterday and was this morning, and that is a city is um, the intersection of two things, and it's best represented by this. This is what a city is. It is the most fantastic machine, the greatest machine that we have invented in order to facilitate social interaction, to bring people together in order to create wealth, create ideas, innovate, and thereby increase the standard and quality of life. That's what that machine that we discovered a few thousand years ago, and it is represented by this. This is what's going on here. People are interacting, talking. The stage is set. There's two pieces. There's a physical part. There's an informational part. Everything that's going on here is bullshit, but it's innovative. People are nevertheless, but it's irrelevant for most people. But every once in a while, what is the dynamic that is going on here magically produces quantum mechanics or Google or whatever. That's what a city is for. So there it is. 
It's the interface between the physicality of a city, the infrastructure, the energetics, the metabolic part, and the socio socioeconomic information exchange part to do with social networks. There it is. So we've seen versions of this throughout this. And uh, so there's two parts. Um, the, as I said, the, um, sorry, let me go back to this, the energetic one, which is very similar to the biological. It's the sort of biological part of the city. We have transport systems, we move energy around and so forth. And that can follow pretty much some of the stuff I talked about earlier. But then there's this other piece, which has a very different character as a network because the characteristic of social networks, not only are they universal, Namely, our social networks here in the United States are not very different than they are in Mexico, Albania, or Somaliland. They're all pretty much the same, because we're all the same human beings, basically. Um, but also, they have this extraordinary characteristic that they have positive feedback in them over short periods of time. And that's what we're doing here. I talk to David, David talks to Jessica, talks to Chris, and talk about... Blah, blah, blah and we build up new things, new things happen. And that has two things. It adds, you get more the bigger you are. That leads to superlinear scaling rather than the sublinear economy of scale scaling we saw. And instead of a decreasing pace of life, the bigger you are, an increasing pace of life. And you can write down, again, what are the things that are being the same kind of phenomena I talked about earlier uh, in terms of the kinds of generic principles. The networks still have to be space-filling. It doesn't matter where you live in the city. You're not part of the city unless you are being serviced, both in terms of information and energy. Every ro a road has to end at your house or your apartment, or something has to end there in terms of the network. But also, cities have evolved in, in, in maybe to minimize time travel. You want to get, most people want to get from A to B as quite quickly as possible, or transform goods as quickly as possible. Furthermore, you want to maximize social interactions in order to get uh, greater wealth and so get more ideas. And that's, so you have to put those into mathematics. And those generically lead, again, to these fractal-like structures and to approximate power laws across these social organizations. And so let me just show you some. This was the first we ever looked at with something quite mundane. It's called petrol stations. I was working with people at the ETH, Switzerland. Uh, and uh, here you saw the gas stations. And what you see for the infrastructure, it is like biology. It's sublinear. This would be linear. Um, the bigger you are, you need less gas stations per capita. Uh, but instead of a slope of 0.75, it's much closer to a point of uh, 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 to a slope of 0.85. And uh, but most importantly, it's approximately universal. These are just four countries, and we've looked at I don't know 30, 40 countries across the globe, uh, everywhere across the globe. These were just Europe, but including China, Japan, and so forth. And uh, they all look like this for gas stations. But what's amazing is they look like this for any infrastructure. It doesn't have to be gas stations. It could be the length of the roads. It could be the, um, uh, the uh, gas lines, electric lines, the volume of buildings, and so forth. Um, so that's interesting, but it's very biological, except it's got a different exponent. But much more interesting, much more fascinating is, of course, this new phenomenon that has only been in existence on the planet for an exceedingly short period of time and has led to this explosion. And for all we know, maybe this may be the only place in the universe that is actually like this, and that is socioeconomic activity. And uh, this gives rise to, uh, as I pseudo-predicted a moment ago, um, superlinear scaling, instead of the bigger you are, the less per capita, the bigger you are, more per capita. And this is just for a few metrics. This is for wages on the left, uh, professional people on the right. Um, innovation is measured by number of patents. This is crime, another innovative activity. 
uh, and so on, police and blah, 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 restaurants. And here I just put together a panel of half a dozen socioeconomic quantities that are quite different in different parts of the world, just to show you by eye, they all have, roughly speaking, the same slope. And that slope is about 1.15. Okay. So um, if they come from social networks, um, is, which is what I'm claiming, is what this comes from, you can test that because uh, you can go out and test the connectivity between people. So you look at social networks, and we did this with uh, the cell phone data, billions and billions of cell phone calls, and analyzing those. And the prediction is, of course, that they should be the same slope as these lines, which indeed you can see by eye they are. And there are just two, there are two different countries on here. One is Portugal and one is the United Kingdom, just to show you that universality. Um, so the other thing that you learn from this is that uh, when we come to deal with not just cities, but all of our multiple problems and the problems of sustainability, we divide things. I, this is totally arbitrary is what I did. I just put boxes around things that I was writing down. But of course, there's boxes around each one of these, and there's boxes within boxes, and that's the way we organize things. And, uh, uh, but what you learn from this it's quite the contrary, of course. There's a whole other side where all of these are interconnected and behaving in the same way, being manifested by these scaling laws derivative from the most fundamental aspect of socioeconomic activity, which is what we're doing here, interacting with each other and so on. So that's what I said here. They are, well, each one is a complex adaptive system and the whole thing is a complex adaptive system of complex adaptive systems. Now, I said before also that the pace of life now, instead of slowing down as in biology, speeds up with size. And there's some um, whimsical graph on the speed of walking in cities. It was from ancient data taken by some people at Princeton. Yeah, it is. It's just coming up to, it's coming, just coming. <laughs> I got three minutes according to this. I can do one last thing. I want to talk about growth, the same thing as in biology. You have a kind of social metabolic rate that gets allocated between maintenance. You have to repair all the roads and the buildings. You have to repair all the people. You have to have hospitals and doctors. It's all part. It's all in here. You grow new things. You develop new buildings and roads. You grow new people and you bring people in from elsewhere. And you write that down and you write it down and you bush it around and you write equations. And that's what you would have got in biology. We just saw that. But now something different happens instead of... So that would be bad in socioeconomic systems in our present post-industrial revolution free market system. You mustn't stop growing, quotes. Um, and uh, indeed, one of the satisfactory things about this whole st structure, this whole theory, is that it leads, in fact, the same equation in structure anyway, leads to um, open-ended growth, which is what we see. And you can fit data to this and so forth. Uh, but it has a very bad um, characteristic, and that is that it has a finite time singularity, which means that if you continue with this, you are destined to stagnate and then collapse. And so how do we avoid that? We avoid it by recognizing that each one in, in this curve, we have a fixed paradigm. We have discovered coal. We discovered bronze. We, there it is. Stop. <laughs> now, let me just finish this. Let me just finish this and I will. But that was pretty good, actually. Um, and um, so if you kept on this, you would collapse. So what it tells you is along here, if you demand open-ended growth, you have to, somewhere along here, you must reinvent yourself by a major innovation, changing the paradigm, whatever, either at the local level or at a, or at a global level or at an individual level. This works for anywhere, anything. Uh, so you go, and, and of course you'd hit another finite time singularity, and it's clear that in order to have open-ended growth, you have to have, uh, you have to keep innovating in a regular way. But the theory tells you two things. 
that are very challenging. One is, as you go along this curve, life gets faster, everything speeds up, but the time between these gets shorter and shorter. So that uh, the rate of innovation necessarily has to accelerate in order to sustain open-ended growth. This is not mine. I have no idea who this guy is. One day he will sue me for using this graph. I found it on, but it looked like my work, so I just borrowed it. And, <laughs> and he did something much more locally, but these various time scales associated with getting 10 million cust time to get 10 million customers for each of these. And if you take those numbers in brackets, you plot them, they fit um, embarrassingly almost precisely what this little theory predicts. Or this one from, uh, I, I stole from Kurzweil, the famous singularity guy, um, whose work I do not like. Um, but he plotted this graph, which also I don't like because it shouldn't have this on it. But here's a line on a log-log plot of this is how long ago you discovered iron and this is um, uh, um, how long it took to develop it this axis. This was the way it plotted. You can derive this in the theory, and this line actually is what that, the theory I just told you predicts. So the whole question is, is any of this sustainable? If everything gets faster and faster, you have to innovate faster and faster in order to keep up. And of course it isn't. It is destined to collapse unless you make some you move out of the whole paradigm, of course. Only if you move out of the paradigm or you redefine what is technically thought of as innovation because one of the weird things that has happened in the last 20 years or so is that innovation has become synonymous with technology rather than, of course, social cultural innovation, um, which is clearly what we need. We've just had one. We're going through one now with the present president, which gives a possibility that we can go through another one soon, I hope, that is anti-Trump. I don't mean anti-him, but where we love each other and we don't need to grow. I don't need to have three cars, which I have. <laughs> and so on. Okay, so I'm sorry. I will finish with this picture. Finish with two things, if you can bear with me. We're Sisyphus. We're rolling the rock up and it's rolling down. So an innovation is simply postponing the problem. You've got to do it again. But we're much worse than Sisyphus. Sisyphus, every time it came back, he had the same time to go up again. Every time it comes back, we've got to move up faster. Fast, and each time it's faster and faster. It's a horrible situation. Okay. I'll finish. Okay. The, the, the one last thing is our, metro, the met, you know, our metabolic rate is about 100 watts sitting in this room. But if you take these numbers, our, our metabolic rate, our social metabolic rate is 11,000 watts. It's 100 times bigger than what it, quote, evolved to be 10,000 years ago. It, in fact, even 3,000, even 1,000 uh, years ago. Okay. Finished. We're equivalent to a 30,000 or 12 elephants. Unless you think I'm a complete bullshitter with this singularity, I have two quotes. One from von Neumann, who you should pay attention to. The ever-accelerating progress of technology gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity, and those of the mathematicians know what that really means, in the history of the race beyond which human affairs, as we know them, could not continue. And he said this. I have no idea why he said it then in 1954. And finally, Bob, in his wisdom quoting Darcy Thompson, I remembered I used to conclude this in slides years ago when I used to talk on this. This is good old Darcy again, marvelous man. Here's what he says, and it leads to the philosophical discussion. It, always, it behoves us always to remember that in physics it has taken great men to discover simple things. How far even then mathematics will suffice to describe and physics to explain the fabric of the body no man can foresee. It may be that all the laws of energy and all the properties of matter and all the chemistry of all the collides are as powerless to explain the body as they are impotent to comprehend the soul. For my part, I think it is not so. 
Consciousness is not explained to my comprehension by all the nerve paths and neurons of the physiologist. That's interesting, after yesterday's, maybe. Nor do I ask of a physicist how goodness shines in one man's face and evil portrays itself in another. And here's his take-home message. But of the construction and growth and working of the body, meaning biology, as of all else that is of the earth, earthy, physical science is, in my humble opinion, our only teacher and guide. So, a shamelessly physicist viewpoint, <laughs> even though he was not a physicist, he was a biologist. So I'm sorry, I did go five minutes over. <laughs> sorry. Jeff, I think you need some lemming questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a good one. I'll think about that.